Welcome to Almost Here, Round the Corner of Future Technology podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies poised to transform our lives for better or worse are the focus of this podcast. Almost Here means these technologies are now here and starting to be used or just around the corner from Bitcoin to artificial intelligence, 3D printing, blockchain, virtual reality, and more. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech Podcast and the Future Tech Health Podcast. And my guest is Angela M. Puff. She's a cancer biologist, a metabolic therapy researcher, and a MHS co-founder, the Metabolic Health Summit co-founder. That's coming up uh, early 2019. So we'll talk about that. We'll introduce her and talk about her work. So Angela, how are you doing? I'm great. How are you? Well, good. Yeah, I thought acronyms are supposed to make stuff easier to pronounce, but it was harder for me to pronounce it for some reason. So. <laughs> right. <laughs> No worries. <laughs> well, cool. Well, well, before we get into your work, um, let's talk about the Metabolic Health Summit. What's that about? And, yeah. um, you know, what's what's interesting about it? Why should people attend? Um, Metabolic Health Summit is really an incredible event. Um, I was just mentioning to you earlier, you know, it was something that started, we started planning the first one in 2015. And, and back then it was known as the... Um, conference on nutritional ketosis and metabolic therapeutics um and we have since then decided that was just too much of a mouthful so we shortened it to metabolic health summit but um it's first and foremost a scientific conference and um at the time when we decided to plan this we said you know there's so many leading scientists and clinicians around the world studying not just ketosis, but that was a major focus, um, but other metabolic therapies um, that are not necessarily, you know, getting together and speaking about their work to each other and kind of stay in their mm-hmm. own field. And we thought we've got to bring everyone together because that's where we as scientists learn. And that's how we take information and move it to the next level more quickly. And so the very, you know, the first event was purely a scientific conference. And now we have evolved into something much more. So we are definitely still a a scientific conference. We have incredible experts, uh, scientists and clinicians and physicians from around the world who are doing the cutting edge research and practice in this field of ketogenic diet, uh, ketosis, uh, metabolic therapies in general. Um, But we've grown beyond that. We, our goal this year, our, our motto is where keto science meets society. And we realized that we have to um, foster that conversation with the real world. And so now we are a scientific conference, but also a conference, you know, um, dedicated to bringing in people who know how to implement this in the real world, influencers in the space who um, can talk about their life stories, how they're using it in their daily lives. Um, We have cooking demonstrations. Uh, We have an incredible keto expo with companies in this space that are making, um, you know, these kind of therapies and this kind of lifestyle practical and uh, enjoyable. Um, So it's a little bit of everything. uh, This is not just for hardcore scientists. This is also for lay people that want to learn about it. Exactly. Okay, great. Yeah, when you talked about metabolic therapies, um, so people should come that want to learn about the ketogenic diet and all the effects it has. And then what about if they have other metabolic, you know, like metabolic syndrome, they call it, I guess, uh, you know, type one or two diabetes, or if they have cancer, or if they, what what are some other silos? You know, we're not promising cures, but at least people will learn about it. But what? What kind of conditions, if people have them, should they look to coming? Well, so the conference has um, a track or different sessions uh, dedicated to the different uses that are being studied for um, the ketogenic diet and other therapies. So there is an entire session on neurological disorders. So there's a variety of conditions where researchers are studying um, these therapies for Alzheimer's, for um, mental health disorders, for migraine for a number of things. There's also a session on cancer. There's a session on um, metabolic syndrome, obesity, diabetes. Um, So we're kind of really running the gamut, bringing in the world's best scientists and clinicians to talk about the state of, you know, of the research, because this is something that is being used 
being studied. It's also being used clinically in, in different areas. Um, and so anyone that has an interest in this space would, would you know, be able to learn a lot there just from the, the people on the ground floor, you know, actually doing mm. that work. Um, and then, you know, also we have sessions on human optimization. So just mm. improving our own wellness and longevity is another big area of interest in this space. So um, That's great. it's really a little bit for everyone. <laughs> so some quick details, where can people go to register and find out more and what's the date and where is it? Yeah, so um, our website is www.metabolichealthsummit.com. Um, all the information is there. It's being held um, in Long Beach, January 31st to February 3rd. Um, there are uh, CME credits available for physicians. Um, so if that's something that you're interested in, check out all of that information on our website. Um, okay. Yeah, but that's the best place. We're also on um, you know, Facebook and Instagram. So. All right, great. Now let's, let's go now into uh, your particular work and research. So tell me a little bit about yourself and what are you working on specifically? Sure. Um, so I'm a research scientist. I um, I work at the University of South Florida in Tampa. I work with Dominic D'Agostino. Um, cool. In our lab, we study um, we study metabolic therapies for a variety of diseases. My primary expertise and interest is in cancer, so cancer biology. Um, I've done a fair what, amount what of work. What kinds of uh, what kinds of cancer? Like yeah. all kinds or certain so, ones. So we study aspects of cancer that are prevalent in many types of cancer, but the model systems that we use are a brain cancer um, system. So this is a mouse model of glioblastoma, which is a very aggressive brain cancer. Uh, we have a mouse model of metastatic cancer, so kind of mimics the terminal, very aggressive cancer type. Um, and then we also more recently have begun doing some work in a breast cancer model as well. Okay. And what's your, um, so you're studying cancer, but what specifically are you, are you trying to apply or see how the ketogenic diet affects these cancers or what specifically are you working on? Yeah, that's, yeah, that's one aspect of what we do. Um, so I've done a fair amount of work with the ketogenic diet specifically in cancer models, um, but also looking at the role of ketones themselves. So exogenously supplied ketones. Um, mm. And then other metabolic targeted agents. So everything from different nutraceuticals, um, metabolic targeted drugs like dichloroacetate or metformin, um, vitamin C, hyperbaric oxygen therapy. That's another big one that I've studied, uh, which okay. is basically, a, oh, yeah, it's basically a way to increase the amount of oxygen that's being delivered to the tumor and it's being studied as a, a potential metabolic therapy, um, particularly as well, let's, let's focus in, uh, yeah, let's focus in on a couple of things. Let's, let's start with the uh, hyperbaric yeah. oxygen. Why would that yeah. have a uh, potentially positive effect on people with cancer? Yeah, so um, it's something that's actually been studied for a while um, and people are still trying to figure out its potential use. So the theory goes, basically what we see when tumors are growing, they're growing under um, very abnormal circumstances. It's um, tissue that should not be forming. But in order to survive, that tissue needs to build its own new blood vessel supply so that it can carry oxygen and nutrients to itself. Um, but because everything is kind of chaotic and directed under you know, the influence of gene mutations and other abnormal circumstances within the tumor, the blood vessels that form within the tumor are not fully mature, they're not properly formed, and they are inadequate um, when it comes to actually supplying enough blood and oxygen to the tumor. So what happens is you end up with these pockets of hypoxia, and that means low oxygen, um, throughout the tumor. And that actually, for many reasons uh, that we don't have to get into, but that actually ends up really increasing the aggressive phenotype of the cancer. So it makes the tumor more aggressive, more dangerous. Hmm. Um, there are a variety of mechanisms. Do you, and Do you think that yeah. um, one reason may be that the tumor is saying, you know, I can't breathe. I need to hurry up and <laughs> go find blood vessels or grow them as quick as possible. Do you think that's a reason? Yeah, that's a really great way to put it. Um, 
yeah, it, in part, it's definitely an adaptive response. So our, our healthy tissues have the same kind of um, system that activate kind of rescue pathways when oxygen is limited, that's typically a transient thing. So think of like a exercising muscle cell, right? Um, oxygen may become limited. The big issue with oxygen is you require oxygen to make energy in the mitochondria. So when oxygen becomes limited, you have to switch over to an anaerobic way of making energy. So an, an oxygen a process that doesn't require oxygen. So right. That's a normal kind of transient process that happens in our healthy cells, um, but it should be transient, right? It, it should fix itself, right? So there's actually a number of adaptive kind of responses when you have that hypoxic signal that activates, you know, protection to say, hey, let's get this cell to survive through this momentary lack of oxygen um, and promote its survival during that state and, and switch its metabolism to another way to make energy for this short time period when we don't have oxygen, but then we'll switch back. Okay. But with tumors, that switch back doesn't happen, right? The, the hypoxia is persistent, causes damage, and you get constitutive kind of activation of these adaptive responses that promote survival, promote proliferation, re-kind of map the metabolism, and all of that contributes to the tumor's growth. Does this uh, tend to accelerate as tumors grow bigger? because there's more parts of it yeah. I and mean, there's, there's less uh, surface area to volume ratio. So there's more parts that yeah. are not exposed to blood. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So in those cases, when the tumor gets large enough, you may actually see um, a region in the center of the core that becomes anoxic, that needs sure. no oxygen. And um, that tissue can actually die there too. So you end up having, um, areas of anoxia, areas of hypoxia, where it's just low oxygen. And that's kind of the sweet spot is are those areas of, of hypoxia because it really activates a lot of um, gene signaling pathways that oh. basically promote survival and aggressiveness of the, the tumor. And then this entire phenotype also contributes to resistance mechanisms. So makes the tumor more resistant to chemotherapy and radiation. That's crazy, yeah. It's like it's as if the uh, you know the cancer is its own life form apart from the body, and it it yeah. resists uh, it resists it, you know its its own death, which is yeah. amazing. <laughs> yeah, it's I always say that cancer is very smart, um, and it is it is incredible how in every situation the tumor seems to find a way to turn what should be a bad <laughs> bad situation into a benefit. I mean, you would think that cutting off oxygen to the tumor would, you know, damage it, but it makes, actually makes it more hardier and more aggressive. So what's, um, okay. So what is hy hyperbaric oxygen? Supposedly, as far as I know, you know, it floods mm -hmm. the tissues, but it saturates them with oxygen. So what would that do yeah. to a tumor and why would that adversely affect the cancer? Yeah. So that's exactly right. So basically hyperbaric oxygen is, um, basically breathing 100% oxygen at elevated barometric pressure. So I'm here in Tampa, so we're basically at sea level. That's one atmosphere of barometric pressure. Um, and I'm breathing 21% oxygen because the air is made up of about 21% oxygen. So if I were to get into a hyperbaric chamber and increase the pressure um, such that maybe I'm at two, two and a half at, uh, atmospheres of pressure, and then I start breathing a gas mixture or a 100% oxygen you know, gas, that would be hyperbaric oxygen. So you're increasing both the percent of oxygen you're breathing and then barometric pressure at which oxygen is being breathed. And in that situation, what you have is oxygen will actually start um, dissolving into the blood. Um, so typically, you know, oxygen is carried bound to hemoglobin, bound to our red blood cells. And that's the primary method of how we get oxygen through our blood and, and delivered to our tissues. But when you increase the percentage or pressure or both of oxygen being breathed, you actually get more oxygen dissolved into the, the liquid compartment of the blood, plasma. And then by diffusion, the oxygen is now at a much higher concentration in the plasma and it will simply diffuse farther into the tissues. So um, that makes sense. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So basically, 
even though if we think about that tumor that forms these maladapted blood vessels, um, well, even if the blood vessels are immature, now the oxygen can, can just diffuse much farther from the vessel anyway. So we can basically reoxygenate those regions of the tumor that were previously hypoxic. And in doing so, we can shut off many of those kind of adaptive signaling mechanisms that the tumor had turned on in response to hypoxia and then kind of shut down that benefit hmm. that it was getting. So that's the idea. So it's like, uh, it's like the tumor is a terrorist and you're placating it <laughs> temporarily with the oxygen to say, it's okay, just relax. <laughs> you can kind of say that, yeah. Um, yeah, it's interesting. interesting. And it's, yeah, and it's something that has been studied for a while um, that has really kind of given interesting results. So as a monotherapy, so as a um, single therapy, and most of this has been in animal model systems, so not a lot done in human trials, but it doesn't seem to do a whole lot when it's given by itself. Um, but the studies that are out there really suggest that it could enhance the response to um, standard of care therapy is like chemotherapy, radiation. And then for us, we saw a really incredible synergy between the ketogenic diet and hyperbaric oxygen. Um, that when we combined those two therapies, it, um, we saw a marked reduction in tumor growth, um, inhibition of metastatic spread, and prolongation of survival in the mouse model metastasis that we were studying. So, yeah, what about? Um the ketogenic diet on its own, what mechanisms yeah. do you believe it affects cancer? And maybe we can form a theory on why the combination does it. <laughs> yeah, I have some thoughts on that. Um, so the ketogenic diet was originally proposed as a potential cancer therapy for its glucose lowering effects. So glucose tumors tend to have um, abnormal or altered energy metabolism compared to healthy tissue. And this is something that was actually discovered a very long time ago, um, even in the, like the 1920s, the early 1900s. Um, Otto Warburg, he was a German biochemist, he found that cancer cells very often, uh, instead of using their mitochondria to make the energy, they start making most of their energy through that anaerobic kind of pathway that I had mentioned earlier, where um, basically it's called uh, anaerobic fermentation or lactate fermentation. So instead of completely running through all the mitochondrial pathways to make energy, they choose this kind of truncated pathway that's typically only used when oxygen is limited. But cancer cells will do this even growing in, you know, in petri dishes where oxygen is not a limiting factor at all. Um, and this is kind of strange when you first think about it because it's a very inefficient way to make energy, and you think about tumors really needing a lot of energy to support their rapid unbridled growth. So um, the energy substrate that feeds into these really important pathways for tumors is glucose, and so tumors will often take up very large amounts of glucose to support these pathways within their cells. And um, this is highlighted by the um, diagnostic imaging modality and FCG PET scan, which is literally just a patient will consume a, a drink that contains radioactively labeled glucose. And because of the avidity uh, for glucose that the tumors have, um, any cancer will suck up that gl glucose at very high rates, and you can see it on this imaging scan. So it's something that's very consistent. Most cancers demonstrate this um, strange metabolism. So um, as it turns out, why tumors do this is probably a little bit more complicated, and we can kind of get into some thoughts on that. But um, so they so they just uh, they have a sweet tooth, I guess. If you put it, if you want to put it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's simply, a great right? way of putting it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they definitely have a sweet tooth. But to be fair, tumors mm -hmm. are. Um, very adaptive, they will take up any energy substrate that they can use to support their growth. So, you know, some tumors also like to take up lots of fatty acids or a certain, you know, amino acids are taken up by certain cancers too. But this metabolic phenotype, the sweet tooth phenotype is really consistent, pretty remarkable. What about a regular, how do you compare that to regular cells? What are their, what are their, 
what can they use for energy? What are their preferred pathways? And, you know, what do they tend to do? Um, well, it kind of depends on what cell you're talking about. So different tissues have different kind of preferences for their energy substrate. Um, okay. You know, free fatty acids, ketones, glucose, um, these are kind of the primary fuels. Uh, ketones are really only around when you're eating a ketogenic diet, when you're fasting or in starvation, or perhaps consuming ketones exogenously. There are supplements now that are commercially available. Um, but I would say those are kind of the primary energy fuels. Protein, um, converted you know, amino acids that make up proteins, those can definitely be used as energy as well, but um, it's kind of considered a secondary role for protein just because our body will first and foremost use those amino acids to replenish the amino acid pool that you might need for building functional proteins within the body. So we can kind of think of, of like glucose and fat and key terms kind of fall under that fat category as the primary mm, okay. energy sources for tissues and different tissues prefer different, different energy substrates. So is the, um, you said cancer is very opportunistic. It, it prefers glucose, yeah. but is it more limited in its ability to use different substances for fuel than regular cells? Maybe. Um, some cancers, it seems to be true. Some, maybe not so much. Um, it is definitely not like something that is totally agreed upon in the field either. So there is data to support that. I think it's very cancer dependent. So you kind of just have to go with what, what is the most evidence uh, for? And I would say that the evidence supports that probably the most consistent metabolic phenotype is, um, is this glucose metabolism. Now, does that mean that these tumors couldn't adapt to another metabolic phenotype if you were to suppress glucose? It doesn't. It's possible that they, they, they can, and probably many can. But there's some, there seems to be something special about this kind of rapid glycolytic phenotype that seems to kind of promote optimal proliferation. And this is, this is also true in our normal cells when they're proliferating. So this is a, a metabolic phenotype that we see in rapidly proliferating cells. Um, so it, it may just be the case that you know, this system really is kind of, in whatever, for whatever reason, optimally available to support rapid proliferation. So might they be able to switch to another metabolic phenotype? Probably to some degree. Will it allow for the unbridled growth that they were experiencing? Maybe not, right? So okay. tumors are very opportunistic, um, but being able to kind of cut off its preferred or maybe its most promoting metabolic kind of pathway maybe that in and of itself is is helpful anyway so why do you think that the ketogenic diet affects cancer then it maybe it slows it down at best or yeah do you think it goes further than that it could actually starve it or kill it or stop it yeah so um so i think that the ketogenic diet and it has been studied in a variety of preclinical models and it's currently in about 31 clinical trials um, but the animal models suggest that very often you see a tumor inhibitory effect. So um, often a reduction in tumor um, presence if the tumor is already formed, or what most studies actually look at is applying the diet early and then seeing if you can slow the tumor growth. And that is often seen in these animal models. Um, there have been a handful of papers that reported either no effect or in a very couple specific situations, there may be certain cancers where this could actually be contraindicated, such that ketosis could potentially promote tumor growth. So that's why it's really yeah. important that we thoroughly, yeah, exactly. It's why it's really important that we thoroughly examine um, this. But that has been really the minute subset of research that's out there, but it, it definitely exists. So it's very important to pay attention to. So. The glucose so what, what, is it, uh, is, what does it look like? What does it look like so far? In you know, in the I know the trials are not done. There's a lot ongoing, but what's yeah. the, what are indications seem to show right now so far? So most of the human trials that are going on um, are in late stage um, cancer patients, typically that have already failed standard of care, um, and. Right now, people are mostly looking at like safety and tolerability of the diet. So 
you know, there's kind of, it's a long process to actually get to the point where you have a large enough study that is statistically powered to answer a question about efficacy. Um, the re results that have been published so far from these trials really tend to support that it does seem to be safe and efficacious in the patient populations that have been tested. Um, and, you know, it, we're probably at the point now where we need to see larger trials so that we can actually look at efficacy. But right now, the studies are just not powered, unfortunately. It's a little bit difficult. So it's, it's extremely difficult, right, to run a, a trial in patients, a diet trial. It's so much more complicated than, you know, testing a new targeted drug where you might have to take a pill once or twice a day. You know, this is literally <laughs> completely changing everything probably that the person ever thought they knew about nutrition. Yeah. And, and it just makes it very, very complicated and compliance is an issue. Funding is also a big issue. It's just, it's difficult to get these kind of trials funded for obvious reasons. What? So. Uh, actually, why? Why is it difficult to get these trials well, funded? Because it doesn't lead to yeah. drugs that would make money? Yeah, basically. And, and it's not like, it's not some kind of conspiracy reason. It's just that you know, a, these trials are expensive, you know, to get an answer about whether or not this is going to affect, you know, survival. You're looking at a multi-year study in lots of humans. If you, you know, want to do it properly, you have to give them every piece of food that they eat for that entire time period. That's a lot of money, right? Um, most, most, you know, clinical trials are supported by the pharmaceutical companies that are testing out their drug because they know that there's an ROI that they can, you know, make money back if the trial, you know, succeeds and that the drug goes to market, then they are they have a way to make the money. Um, for diet trials, it's just not like that. And there's there's not a lot of incentive to put money up front and be kind of more of like a a pure kind of academic pursuit for which you know there are lines of funding that kind of go towards that kind of stuff, but it's just not as deep pockets as um you know more other lines of funding that perhaps may come from big pharma um and it's just difficult to design so um things are moving slowly but they're moving you know they are moving for sure when when i started this research probably i guess going on about 10 years ago this is very much something that there wasn't a lot of interest in there were just a few groups here and there kind of doing this work um, and over the past decade, I've seen a huge increase in the interest for this work and the number of clinical trials that are ongoing. So, so things are definitely moving, which is exciting. And it's because we, we get keep getting more um, preclinical studies that really support that, yeah, this seems to be efficacious in animals. We really need to check in humans now. And, um, and you had asked, you know, why we think the ketogenic diet might be working. And right. it's a really complicated story that glucose is really only scratching the surface. And that's something I can kind of talk about a little bit if, if you want to. Well, I spoke to Thomas Seyfried and he, he seemed to say it was glucose and glutamine, but is it more than that you think? Or like, what do you really suspect? I do, yeah. Affects I, I, so I, I think that's some like part of it. Glutamine is one of those amino acids that um, is particularly, you know, useful for some tumors. Um, for me, I think a lot of it is actually insulin. So where glucose goes, insulin goes, right? So if you have an elevation in glucose, you're going to have an elevation in insulin. Insulin is a potent growth factor. It is insulin receptor and IGF receptor, insulin-like growth factor receptor, are overexpressed on many or most cancers. And insulin drives tumor development and tumor growth in, in many, many situations. And so I think a big part of the story is actually insulin. So suppressed, the ketogenic diet is, is associated with the suppression of insulin. And then actually, aside from that, um, ketones themselves seem to be a really important part of the study, over the story. Um, they are signaling molecules. They have direct influential effects within the cell, communicating with other molecules within the cell, and then also even directly influencing the expression of our genes. So the primary ketone, beta-hydroxybutyrate, or BHB, uh, acts as a histone deacetylase inhibitor. This is actually a class of anti-cancer drugs, HDAC inhibitors. And BHB functions as one naturally that your body produces. And 
essentially what it does is it reopens up expression of parts of the genome that are characteristically closed off in many tumors. And it reopens up some genes that actually kind of suppress uh, the tumorigenic phenotype. So there's just a lot of different mechanisms. There's also an influence on inflammation. That's a big one. Again, through a signal signaling mechanism, BHB suppresses inflammation um, by inhibiting the assembly of this thing called the inflammasome. And the inflammasome is overactivated in many cancers and contributes to the aggressiveness of the tumor, contributes to resistance to therapies. Um, so here's another potential mechanism by inhibiting inflammation in the tumor microenvironment that maybe the diet is working. The story seems to go far beyond the glucose lowering story. And to be honest, I'm not convinced that a frank lowering of glucose, like a basal lowering of glucose is, is really the bigger part. I think maybe it is eliminating the postprandial spikes in glucose that occur after carbohydrate laden meals that maybe is more of an impact because a lot of people, people on a ketogenic diet, their basal glucose, baseline glucose may drop some, but it's not always a very impressive drop. And um, there's actually, in some of the clinical trials in humans, it's suggested that even when glucose doesn't change, the most promising response in some of those patients is actually more associated with the elevation in ketones, but not with the drop in glucose. So it also kind of supports that maybe ketones are also a really important part of the story. Well, I would think that, okay, so a ketogenic diet, you're going to have much less of a glucose spike because you're not having carbs and mm -hmm. you're not having sugar nearly as much. And then your insulin right. should be a lot lower because it's not needed to, you know, to take care of the excess glucose. And then mm -hmm. possibly it, it may lead to less inflammation when you talked about a flamazone. So maybe that's why mm -hmm. the ketogenic diet looks like it's able to affect cancer so much is because it's on multiple fronts, it's uh, reducing its yes. ability to to function and to, and to live. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that it is a multifaceted approach and there are probably certain mechanisms which may be at play in certain cancers um, that are you know, really important for certain cancer types and then have no effect in other cancer types, um, which makes it interesting. It makes it probably more likely to be more useful in a greater number of cancers because of that multifaceted nature. Yeah. Hmm. And you mentioned early on the uh, I, I'll, I'll mess up the name, but it's D acetyl acetate. Or what, what was the compound? Um, for with um, the ketone molecule, beta hydroxybutyrate, or no, one? no, you had mentioned um, it, you you lumped it with, along with metformin. It was um, oh, metformin, and you mentioned uh, another compound. Dichloroacetate. 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 Is another Sorry. One. Yeah, that aid. Yeah. So that is a um, compound that modulates energy metabolism. So it basically, for the uh, biochemistry uh, nerds in the audience, uh, inhibits mm -hmm. the inhibitor of pyruvate dehydrogenase. So it inhibits PDK, which inhibits pyruvate dehydrogenase, which activates PDH. So you basically increase the amount of energy metabolites that are flowing into the mitochondria um, instead of where in many tumors, those are actually kind of shipping out towards the lactate fermentation pathway. Um, okay. And DCA we have um, looked at in um, an animal model and in cell culture, and it seems to induce an oxidative stress response. That is probably um, part of the reason it seems to have an effect. Um, and then actually one of our former graduate students who's now a, a postdoc, uh, Dr. Nathan Ward, he published looking at the combination of DCA and metformin. And metformin is, most people have probably heard of metformin. It's a diabetes drug um, that for diabetes, it's prescribed because it inhibits hepatic gluconeogenesis or lowers circulating glucose. And that's kind of one reason it's proposed to maybe have an effect in cancer. But interestingly, it's actually probably its other effect is to inhibit complex one of the electron transport chain um, that is probably more responsible for its anti-cancer effect. And that also seems to induce an, an oxidative stress response in cancer cells. Um, and he found that these you know, agents alone had um, some therapeutic benefit in the model that we were using. There wasn't a combined benefit though of adding them together. So there may have been some redundant mechanisms at play. 
Yeah, I, I, I mean, there's, there's so much to ask you. I won't go on forever, but uh, <laughs> it brought up an idea. What what happens in cancer cells to the mitochondria of a cell? So, um, the mitochondria. It, it's interesting. Um, there is a lot of information to suggest that many tumors have what appears to be quite abnormal mitochondrial function. Um, in some cases, frank outright damage in terms of the morphology is very altered. They may be missing the cristae, which are the folds of the inner mitochondrial membrane, and that's where oxidative phosphorylation and aerobic respiration occur. It's where the, the mitochondria actually make the ATP energy. Um, abnormal expression and activity of the proteins that catalyze ATP synthesis within the mitochondria. Um, DNA mutations, so mitochondria have their own DNA. You'll find mutations in the mitochondrial DNA. Um, so a lot of abnormalities kind of across the board. Um, the degree to which they are uh, frank kind of defects versus adaptive responses, wherein the tumor is having some kind of, it's adapted the phenotype because it, it benefits it for some reason, is a, a little bit confusing. Um, and it's probably that probably the truth is, is somewhere in the, that both are happening. There are certain aspects of this kind of abnormal metabolism that we know are actually just really beneficial to the tumor. So if you are not fully sending your glucose into the mitochondria all the way through the mitochondrial metabolism pathways where you end up breathing off those carbons of glucose as CO2 in your breath you can actually instead redirect those truncated metabolites towards biosynthesis. So which basically means instead of fully metabolizing glucose in the mitochondria, you can start, you can make a little bit of ATP through the lactate fermentation and instead put those other carbons to use to making new lipids, new DNA, new protein that's going to go into the growing tumor. So it supports the growth mm. of the tumor. So that is actually the most common and most well-accepted explanation for the Werber effect, why tumors have this metabolic phenotype. That's what most, I would say most cancer scientists think that it's an adaptive response so that you, it's, it's actually just a benefit that the tumor has figured out. Um, but yeah, there's so some really like the, data. I was, I was just going to mention there is, and I know you talked to Dr. Seifer and I'm sure he talked about this quite a lot. There's a lot of convincing data too that suggests well, that may be at play to some degree and maybe to a great degree in some tumors, but there's a lot of convincing data that the mitochondria are also damaged a lot of the time too. So that could also be a very big explanation as to why we see this phenotype as well. I think it's both. I think both are going on and certain cancers are probably more heavily one or the other, but I think both are very important. But regardless as to why that's happening, it still makes the Warburg effect a very, very, you know, good therapeutic target because whether or not the mitochondria are acting this way because they're damaged or because it's just more beneficial to the tumor, if you still are able to kind of target those, that phenotype, cut off those energy supply, you know, to those pathways, then you could, right. you know, have an effect. I think there's probably two reasons. One is that it seems like Cancer kind of uh, changes the goal of the cell and yeah. changes its goals to, you know, to favor the cancer. It, it changes its mission essentially. And then mm -hmm. you can't have you can't have everything, you know. So there's always trade-offs. So mm -hmm. I think that because it alters, and this is just my speculation, by the way, but mm -hmm. because it alters the cell's function and it takes it in a new path, and you know, it, it changes how it uh, uses energy and everything that there's going to be trade-offs. Some stuff may get damaged or not function as well. Other stuff will be preferred. Mm -hmm. But it seems like that's yeah. the entire, uh, you know, way of cancer is that's what it's doing. It's on a different mission. It's all about self-preservation. But there's trade-offs. And I think yeah. in those trade-offs is where we're going to find ways to attack it. Yeah, absolutely. I, mean, I think that's a really great way to view it. I think that's definitely true. Yeah. So hmm. I guess figuring out all those changes and all those ways, those are going to take quite a long time. So hence the research <laughs> and the difficulty. Yes. Yes, absolutely. But, you know, oh. it's, um, it's really neat that there's such increased interest in this space. So, um, you know, we are moving ahead on a lot of fronts and we've formed really great collaborations with leading 
scientists around the country, around the world even, who are now really interested in this. So that's incredibly encouraging when, when, a, when a subject starts to get, you know, gather the attention of really the top researchers in the field and you know, okay, we're really on the right yeah. path. And I think that's what's happening. Well, unfortunately, cancer and diabetes, but I mean, they affect so many people and so adversely. And yeah. it's, I mean, it's, it's yeah. a huge thing to try to solve. So it makes sense. It is. So, uh, and it's, know, it's also a very, uh, sorry, I was just going to say really briefly that it's also a very complicated topic, which, you know, I think is probably obvious <laughs> from our conversation, yeah. but, um, you know, that's, it's great that, you know, people are talking about it, but it's also something that, you know, we have to really get into the details on because it's, it's not some black and white kind of issue and it's definitely not, you know, solved, so to speak. Mm. So, um, you know, based on your research and everything you're seeing out there, um, are you hopeful that there'll be uh, significant interventions into cancer, most cancers, some cancers? I mean, what do you see as like the near term future, the next five years, let's say? Yeah, um, I'm definitely hopeful that um, some really promising things are on the horizon. Um, I think it is now obvious that diet really influences cancer in general, and then also response to treatment. Um, And that is something that has for very, way too long been ignored. So I don't necessarily know that the ketogenic diet is going to be the, you know, number one across the board, but that's one that I'm interested in studying. And I think it's the most promising right now. But just the fact that we're starting to evaluate how is diet impacting, we're thinking about that in the clinical trial. So it's kind of sad to think um, that it's possible that some of the confusion behind some of the failures in the clinical trials that have happened in the cancer therapy space over the past couple decades could be in part because of the background diet that the individual was eating. And researchers were assuming that it didn't really matter. Um, a good example of that is there was a paper that came out earlier this year, Dr. Lewis Cantley published in Nature looking at um, a a targeted gene therapy, PI3 kinase inhibitor. And basically these um, inhibitors uh, inhibit this pathway, this metabolic pathway in in cancers, but people just weren't responding like they had hoped. And as it turned out, there was an inherent mechanism wherein the person would take the inhibitor and then the pancreas would just release more insulin and then it would reactivate that pathway they were trying to shut down. And so he ended up studying the ketogenic diet in combination with the PI3 kinase inhibitors and then removed the mechanism because it suppressed the amount of insulin that was around. So now the pancreas wasn't just, you know, using this resistance mechanism and it restored sensitivity to the, to that therapy. And for me, that was super promising and very incredible to see in such a high impact um, paper. But it was like, wow, I wonder how many treatment, you know, we weren't able to kind of understand what was going on because individuals were just eating who knows what, you know, um, while they were going through the trial. It's kind of a tangent to your question, but um, no, I'm no, it's, it's encouraged... hard to control. I mean, people yeah. report, I mean, everyone, you know, I don't want to say if I ate something bad, no one does. So I understand it's very yeah. difficult and willpower mm-hmm. is not infinite either. So it's very mm-hmm. difficult to be like strict and that's it. And, yeah. you know, so I totally understand right. that makes it difficult. Yeah. Yeah. Well, very good. So what's, what's the best way for people to find out more about your research? Uh, you know, maybe to ask questions. I don't want to, you know, swarm you with questions, but uh, how can they reach <laughs> out if they, if they need help when they have questions? Yeah. Um, so I keep a professional page on Facebook where I just try to share, you know, work that we're doing, but also really just publications that come out in this space. Um, and it's just at Angela Poff PhD. Um, and then I'm, I should probably increase my activity on some other social platforms, but I'm not quite very (laughs) active on those yet. So yeah, probably Facebook is the best. And, um, something I always think it's really important to kind of point out, you know, if, if, if you're listening to this, um, because you're a patient or you have a loved one, you know, um, if you want to learn more, it's just look on clinicaltrials.gov. I would say that's your best bet to see if you can get involved in a formal clinical trial. Um, and then whatever you decide to do, no matter what, please, please just work closely with your oncologist because this is 
something that requires supervision and we don't understand. And it's, it's not something that's been proven in, in human trials yet. So it's really mm -hmm. important to have that guidance and, and supervision uh, from your, your cancer physician. So just make sure, you know, you're doing that. It's very important. Very good. Well, I'm glad you came on the podcast. I appreciate it. And uh, folks can also see you at the Metabolic Health Summit the end of January. And uh, thanks for coming. Awesome. Thank you so much. You have been listening to Almost Here, Around the Corner Future Technology Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Subscribe to this podcast, post a review, to discover more future technologies that are poised to transform our lives for better or worse, such as Bitcoin, artificial intelligence, 3D printing, blockchain, virtual reality, and more.